Hello and welcome to the Rock and Roll to Success. Today I have Alexander Pachala, who is igniting cityscapes with visionary designs, rewriting the future of urban living. What's up, my man, Alex? Hi, Sintro, Gabriel. Thank you so much for having me, man. I'm uh, excited. I'm really happy that you invited me also. Like, I'm really excited. This is like uh, my first podcast. And honestly, it's pretty cool what you're doing as well. I love the combination of words you've got. Uh, you combine rock and roll and the road to success and use the, them together. That's cool. Awesome, man. Thank you for that. Yeah. There are three things that I really like. Rock music, getting on the road, and paving that road to success. So those are three elements that I really enjoy. We're going to have yeah. a rock in time right now. That's for sure, man. Oh, yeah, man. <laughs> and talking about rock and roll, you have your background picture on X is quite a rock and roll kind of place because it's in Berlin, Potsdamer Platz. So what's the story behind that? That was um, on my third trip to Berlin. Uh, I was... Uh... I was already accustomed to certain places in Berlin and I know that Berlin was developed with a not a monocentric design of the city and by monocentric and of course I'm going to just um, say that I'm an urban planner as well and I say this kind of jargon because it's like a kind of vocabulary that we use and um, I love to uh, look at city forms and how they got developed throughout the time. And Berlin has a particular case uh, because it was um, going through a lot of changes. It's a city that uh, was uh, from this after the Second World War to uh, 90, the 1990s. Uh, it was split in half and there was a uh, two different modes of development, two different modes of life. And it was one part communist, one part, cap one part capitalist. And it was also uh, encircled by this huge um, uh, uh, democratic federal state of uh, Deutschland. And of course, that was all communist. So it was like Berlin was just this little, little guy with a little bit of uh, capitalism in it. And you had the other part, which is a, a big, large communist. And uh, it had many different centers as well that developed because of that dynamic. Um, there was the center in more of the communist side, which is uh, Alexanderplatz, which is that big, huge um, plaza uh, with the large tower, which we call the Pope's Revenge as, as a joke. I love that place. <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing cool spot, honestly. And there's also this other center they call uh, the Zoo Garden as well, where you have the Berlin Zoo next to it and a few uh, uh, large buildings too. And Potsdamer Platz is like the third node of development, which is, uh, that was like the last place I didn't see because on my first trip, I saw Alexander Platz. And the second one I saw is Zoo Garden. And then the third one was Potsdamer. And this was like the best image of what I wanted to show was really like the most urban thing I took in picture of myself because I went to many places and of course I scrolled through my, my photo gallery in uh, iCloud and that was the only like a really nice uh, picture that I could utilize as a banner and I really wanted to make it my own so I don't get uh, all said as like well you didn't take that picture you just took a picture copy save and put it there so yeah, it was uh, my own shot and it's a cool place because it had uh, so many um, S-bands, U-bands and, and buses going in and it was like, uh, there's also this uh, regional train station. So it's it's a big, huge hustling, bustling hub of activity. There was a shopping complex, lots of uh, uh, commercial space. Uh, there was a lot of office towers as well. So it, it was really, and, and it was a lot of people on the image too people walking and that's what you kind of want in the public realm and want people to be there if if you have a city that's a, a ghost town then that's not a city it needs people it needs life in it 
So yeah, that's like the original. That's the uh, that picture on this uh, my banner. Banner. Wow, it's awesome to know that you took it yourself, and I really like that place. I have some fond memories of Berlin as well. And let's not get too much into that kind of thing, but <laughs> Berlin is is an awesome place, and like you said, the history of the city is very interesting because of that divide during the Cold War and how the city is completely different, and even the street lamps, the street lights, they they are different from the communist side to the capitalist side, and yeah, Berlin is is such a weird place overall, yes. and. It's a place that I recommend anyone to go just because of its weirdness. It's not the most beautiful city. It's not the most anything city except for weirdness, probably. But it's a very interesting place to go to. And and after the wall fell, so many artists from Germany and maybe even from other places behind the Iron Curtain went there. And yeah, it's such a crazy place. Oh yeah, it's insane. It became um, it became really uh, how do you say nice nutrients for the Bohemians. <laughs> Honestly, like every creative wanted to go there. Uh, probably uh, the mo most of the creatives from uh, Paris and London were starting to get priced out, and were like, you know, "Just ship to Berlin right now." And uh, yeah, it's a, it was a cool place that uh, had a awesome graffiti culture as well. And uh, along the whole freaking wall of Berlin <laughs> during the, the Cold War era, it was jam-packed with graffiti. Lots of people were just going tagging there, doing their art and expressing their uh, sincere um, will to be reunited again and to receive their loved ones uh, from one side of the wall to the other. So it, it, it's, a, it's a cool place, honestly, Berlin. And I, it always happens to be a place where I transit to. Because I usually go other places in um, in Europe, and uh, yeah, it's 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 so close to to Poland when I'm where I'm from, and uh, it's just like Berlin is the cheapest flight that gets me closest to Poland. So I always happen to to always have a flight to Berlin. Oh, so that's interesting. So you're actually Polish? Yes. Where from? Uh, from this. Well, my mother's from Poznań. And my father is from Lublin. So my mother is more closer to the German border. Uh, that's her hometown, the Poznań. And then my father, Lublin, is more closer to the Ukrainian border. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, Poland's awesome. I've been to Poland twice. And Krakow is absolutely beautiful. The city center is amazing. Yes. I also went to Warsaw. That... I Although I found interesting as well, but Krakow is is a gem. It's really beautiful. No, it's the authentic Poland, honestly. Warsaw was destroyed completely during the war. Yeah. So, so everything you see in Warsaw is just the restructuring. It wasn't. They they tried to replicate a little bit of how the old time was, but it doesn't have that um, that sense of age. Honestly, it doesn't. It's yeah, all... it's not as authentic and. Exactly. They have a bunch of high-rise buildings, and it's nice. It's a nice city. It's pretty modern, but you don't get that old town European thing that we tend to think when we think about Europe. No, it's I'm not gonna go about Poland that much, but people from Poland like complain about Warsaw because it's not like Poland. <laughs> it's like this, uh, but it's mostly like this with mo a lot of. Um, states where you have this uh of course uh this capital versus the rest of the country divide yeah like i know it's a lot like this in france and there's also i can't name a few countries like this on the top of my head to i just want to be like as just as possible in my answer but i know it's the same case for like uh, paris versus france and there's of course some yeah or london Poland. versus the uk exactly this is like this uh, capital and Hinderland dynamic, but it's not, it's no longer Hinderland. Like it was Hinderland like uh, 500, 700 years ago. It's all a bunch of uh, cities and other provinces, so or uh, states. So it, it, it's just a weird dynamic sometimes people have. Yeah, but I think it's pretty natural when you have this huge metropolis that kind of monopolizes or 
everything tends to concentrate there or flow towards the the capital. Mm -hmm. And although I think it's kind of natural to have this in, there are countries in Europe that you don't have that much of that dynamic, like uh, Germany, for example, because they were a bunch of kingdoms before city in and of itself, or even a Spain that many things flow to Madrid, but they managed to kind of decentralize a little bit. But yeah, when we have this thing with a big capital city, it's hard to not get that feeling, I guess. Yeah, it's um, I think it has to do with money. I, I in my presumption, mm -hmm. because uh, it's gonna go to the capital where the already that um, say richer class and political class is already established, and people from foreign uh, nations are able to uh settle their business and to settle like um a franchise or a branch there or a division to do a regional um regional expansion in that place and usually the capital is like the uh no no brainer uh solution yeah. especially like a, a country like Poland which uh, was completely not developed uh, with capitalism that like of course they're going to go to the capital where all the politicians are and they're going to start their growth right there. And, of course, uh, that what created is didn't uh, really... Of course, there are some multinational companies that go into other uh, cities uh, around that country. But this just this anchored concentration in that area. And uh, then after you had a lot of the tech, uh, the tech sector that developed there. And everybody was going to that city because it was just... Uh, no brainer, honestly. It was easier. The infrastructure was already there. Uh, the 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 for for the roads, for uh, the housing was already well developed, and also for uh, internet access too. Yeah, it is a no brainer. And I know you're itching yourself to talk about housing today. Go ahead. And. We Since we were talking about Berlin, I know that, we, like we said before, many artists, many UPs, they went to Berlin because it was very cheap at the time. But now it's the housing market there is crazy. My friend is living there right now, and he said that to get an apartment, it was such a fight. There were like lines of 20 people fighting for the same apartment. And they're not cheap at all. So how how the hell did this happen? And how can we make this not happen in our own cities in the future? How much time you got? <laughs> Days. <laughs> um, okay, so trying to approach this in the right angle to start it off because... What happened is there was an attractiveness to these kind of quarters. And, uh, of course, it's it did not start in general in Berlin. Or, in my case as well, in my city, Montreal. And uh, it, they're both, I think, in similar examples because they did uh, go through historical uh, moments in their life to have created this kind of... Uh, depressive state of inattraction to finally something happening that it allowed uh, people and then capital to spill in as an investment mm -hmm. and into those uh, neighborhoods and then eventually sectors of the city and then eventually the whole city and it also happened in uh, New York uh, like Greenwich Village in Brooklyn it happened to uh, many central um, neighborhoods or like outskirting central neighborhoods in various cities where you had um, this uh, disinvestment in housing. It, uh, of course, the back then it was also uh, very um, favorable to live in the outskirts, the suburbs of the city, but nobody wanted to live in the center. And um, then what happened is, of course, some people were fed up with this kind of lifestyle of the suburb of not having the kind of a more dynamic something more else. And you had these uh, people that wanted to be 
in places that were very vibrant, very um, proximous. You didn't have to have a car to move around. And uh, that, of course, attracted people to be in those places that were still, like, there were ghost towns in the center. There were still, like, the art galleries. There were clubs. There were uh, very, jobs, attractions. And uh, people wanted to live close to those. So you had, um, say, uh, artists that uh, decided to live in these uh, places that were not really uh, expensive because there were just bunches of rubble, honestly. Like, I'm pretty sure that when um, the wall fell in Berlin, people, uh, like, the apartments were probably in good shape, honestly. Like, they were probably not necessarily always uh, up to par with what uh, building codes were in the Western block of Germany. And uh, it just created cheap rents that permitted people, creatives, artists, to live close to, like, the prospects of uh, art galleries so they can be able to commission their art. And... Um, were able to also lower the cost of uh, their dwelling by uh, having like uh, okay housing you know as long as it's a roof over my head and i have the space to create and do my art then that um, of course is what i need and of course it it came their appearance and their activity and their culture attracted people that we're like, oh, this thing is nice. This art is nice. I like, I like uh, how the vibe is here, and we get these hippies, you know, <laughs> that were attracted to this, and they, of course, had a little bit more cash than, say, the so-called artists, and this here is uh, the big word that's called gentrification. And this um, is really a process of, like, um, say, neighborhood revitalization. But, of course, it is... Some academics started to, like, phase it out in different phases where you would have, like, this sort of um, gentrification where you had uh, particular individuals, say, like, a couple that decided to build a home, uh, to buy a home, and to retrofit it, improve it, thus, of course, increasing the property value of that home. But how property values work is that, of course, when your property value goes up, then your neighboring property values go up, and it's oh, a spillover yeah. effect that way. So that's how a neighborhood gets more and more expensive, is because your neighbors are doing something nice, so no choice. Your, your value is going to go up, and then the tax is going to go up, and then, of course... When you have many individuals doing that, starting to invest in under-invested properties, then it just brings the price of housing completely up there. And uh, it went to like many cycles because, of course, when you have, a, you're, you're say, a couple, you bought a lot for um, 100 grand and you were able to sell it for, uh, uh, say, 350. And you had way more money, so you go to get to another one and then, some people had this culture of flipping. And of course, you had entrepreneurs that started flipping in bulk. And then, of course, you would have no longer flips, but literally a revitalization in the scale of uh, creative destruction where they would buy up a lot. And some intentionally did this too. They buy up the lot and did absolutely nothing with it. Mm. Nothing. Okay. And uh, they would leave it to rust, to ruin. Or until a fire happens, coincidentally. And then they're able to build the nice property that instead of uh, renovating a tenement housing that's uh, three stories high, then they're able to build a building that's six stories high and to subdivide it in a few apartments and really be able to have a R ROI, a return on investment, uh, that's way larger than if they had to uh, of course, um, renovate the buildings that were already there at the disposal. And I know it's um, it's a common practice in my city where 
you have these um, individuals that own uh, numerous cumulative lots of old homes that were like Victorian style homes and um, they would wait so they can buy another one next to it and the neighbor wanting one and whatsoever and then what so happens sometimes they do this is uh, well they, it goes down to ruin by accident or because it's no longer safe to have that uh, construction and uh, they uh, keep it for parking for a while because uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't worth it to do a skyscraper at that moment at that time and these people really think uh, long term really long term by having these properties at hand in their portfolio because and uh they would uh, generate income by doing the parking and of course well the zoning requirements were at uh, a minimum height to a maximum height and we have maximum heights here in montreal and uh if it didn't if they didn't have enough money to build them at the minimum height, then they would have to wait for it, them to have enough money. So they would have other uses. And a lot of the 90s in my city, that half of the lots in downtown were parking lots. Even more than a half. Because uh, it's either we accommodated to have the car a lot, or uh, just old buildings turned, uh, turned to ruin. And then they didn't want to build. It wasn't worth it to start a, a project. So they just used it as a parking lot and pay. Uh, you would pay like ten, uh, no, five dollars a day, and then eventually ten dollars, and then you know go to the trajectory of inflation, and you get the the, the idea of how the business worked. And um, I really went on a tangent for there uh, for that, but just to go back to the kind of investors that they um, eventually wanted to make more expensive and nicer homes. And uh, a lot of uh, that market, that demand uh, kept growing. But in that kind of situation where like developers weren't incentivized to build, then the supply did not match the demand. So it was it's a lagging effect that now we're seeing it's doing a crisis. And... The how there's a housing crisis, honestly, uh, with that because I think that developers didn't steadily develop at the right pace, and a lot of uh, inner cities are really having a hard time to have affordable housing because now they're pressured to build, they're incentivized to build, but the price is so unaffordable. Yeah, as you were talking about this, I was thinking about the spillover effect that you mentioned of when one of your neighbors renovates their home or they are building, retrofitting this, that their value will go up. And then by simply being their neighbor, since the neighborhood is nicer now, your value also goes up. But you were mentioning small investors like first a couple that built their own home so they could live in but then those house flippers that they become landlords and they might have one two five ten twenty homes yeah but i think it gets really ugly when we start getting those huge investment funds that do this on an industrial scale and yes. then they do this and they buy whole plots of land the whole the whole block, like you said, but they do this in many blocks throughout the, the same city or throughout yeah. the country. I know that in Canada, they've done this also in Toronto. They've done this in Vancouver and all of the big cities. You have some sort of housing problem and of yeah. gentrification. And yeah, I think pretty much in every major city, this kind of happens, but I think you guys are more on the forefront of it on the spearhead. Yes, we so we see, I was taking a look at some of the recent news and it's ridiculous. Like even a couple with good wages, sometimes they aren't able to pay for rent. And, and how can you have a city that's unaffordable to a middle class or to mm -hmm. even an upper middle class? Like where are the people going to live? They're going to move. Yes. That's what we did. 
It's like I no longer, yeah. I no longer live in Montreal. I live in the outskirts, and uh, it's much more uh, affordable to do that. That mentioning of um, the big hedge funds and that that's like really the third kind of wave because uh, first wave was really particular people couples and third wave was more like these flippers that really this they do a business for that mm -hmm. and then of course the third wave is uh, the capital that comes from foreign investment and you have uh, various uh, people that come to the city for the city because if you think of uh, places that I would I would say quote unquote hyper gentrified, like New York, London, Paris. Th those are like people from other countries with a lot of money that come to these places because they probably well oh this is a nice place because this is New York I love the brand I'm gonna eat hot dogs and uh, the, the, <laughs> there's nice restaurants here and uh, you have uh, they seen it on movies as well they're featured in a lot of cultural uh, media. And it, it, there's this attractiveness to a city as well, depicted in uh, our films, our music, and uh, it really has this like um, it's branding a city, honestly. And you like, yeah. you know, you you are what you eat, you are what you buy, you are what you consume, but you are also like this uh, kind of saying as you are where you live. So if you're gonna live in New York, you're gonna be a New Yorker, and you're gonna be associated with all these cultural elements that makes New York uh, New York. And um, it's a it's a weird vibe, honestly. And it's true that Canada were in the forefront because I think um, a lot of uh, you know a lot of people from foreign countries were that were rich and able to buy a property here and invest. Uh, they wanted to have uh, the, the the wide open nature that we provide. But it's true that. Canada is not that organized. There's a lot of green and uh, mm -hmm. green spaces, a lot of forestry, and also uh, the distance between our, our cities is very, very long. So there's there's a lot to go around, but there's also um, no, our our cities are really spread out. They're really they're really uh, prone and are categorized as sprawl, urban sprawl. So the there's a lot of space and there's not a lot of concentration of pollution like in European cities and Asian cities as well. But are all of these properties actually occupied? Because I've seen, at least in New York, there are places or whole buildings that are pretty much the whole time, no one's there. They're just investments or even mm -hmm. money laundering. So... How is Montreal city center right now? If you go to the residential corridors of the city, do people actually live there? Or are there many things that are unoccupied? It's occupied. It's There's a lot of people. It's just that there's a lot of people that drive a couple of blocks, which I don't understand that. Like, I... I I lived in the suburb of Montreal, but on an island. And I would take the bus and the metro and walk and, you know, sleep. Yes, I had to to take at least two hours by public transit to get to, to downtown. But there's literally now people that live in the center that drive around, which I don't get it because... When I'm in the center, I just walk around everywhere. And even now today, like I, I take the bus and I walk around and I'm like, I need a damn car in this city. It's like I know this thing is like the back of my hand. And it's convenient also to walk. It's pretty practical and very nice. And um, it's um, the example when you gave me about empty properties. Of course, there's this Airbnb culture. Mm -hmm. This problem, this ghost of our Airbnb and a lot of people do capitalize on the fact that they can have numerous properties and manage them and buy some and also rent them, not rent them to the local population because that is not profitable. There's so many laws and regulations for protecting renters that uh, some landlords, some uh, real estate owners do not find the benefit in renting to people that live there. And they rather uh, put in an Airbnb, which is uh, very it's difficult to reg. It's 
it's difficult to regulate a multinational corporation for their activity and their activity with uh, amongst users. And uh, of course, you can you can charge them like insane cash. Honestly, like minimum for one night Airbnb is like uh, fifty dollars. So fifty dollars times thirty, that's a thousand five hundred. But that's you can charge a person fifty dollars for a room, but for Somebody with a rent, that's a whole apartment, one, a thousand five hundred. But I'm, I might even be like off this because now I, I hear, I hear people uh, paying rent. That's a thousand seven hundred, two thousand, two thousand five hundred, and this is expensive rent. Honestly, I, I don't, I don't see how you can have a normal paying job and save on the side or invest on the side and uh, we really had this dilemma personally me and my girlfriend um, we were together we were together for already uh, a year and a half and uh, we uh, decided to move in with each other it was on uh, April 2023 and uh, we were both each other paying rents. So, like I was paying my own rent, and she was paying her rent, and she had a mm-hmm. she had a roommate as well. So there was this dynamic. So eventually, it's like okay, well, if we're gonna make it, we we have to like I have to move in because <laughs> it's not just gonna be life is gonna be hard, honestly. And um, then I was uh, in that uh, apartment with her, the roommate. We were three. And the rent was uh, thousand seven hundred, and that we knew as well that he was going to inc- the landlord was going to increase the rent to almost two grand for that apartment. And the f- the stupid thing about this as well is that there was it was a really bad 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 construction. Honestly, it was a new construction, but there was a lot of vices like it was crazy like it didn't even deserve to be we didn't deserve to pay that price honestly but since it was a a property that was um no older than five years the guy had carte blanche on whatever rent he could charge to uh, renters honestly he could charge anything and it was like well construction costs were too high so i gotta remake my money i have to go to, uh, to, to to a balance of zero blah blah you know and he was driving a Tesla <laughs> Model S. <laughs> it's like this guy is, he, he didn't even bother coming in or sending an electrician or a plumber or a carpenter to fix up the issues that we had in that place. And we decided, you know what? Whatever we can find in the market to buy, we buy. And we managed to get a little bit further, but at least we're paying less than what that place would have cost us. And we would have lost money because that would have been that difference would have not been saved up. Which is crazy, honestly. Especially that we managed it in the time where interest rates are really high. <laughs> and did you manage to get a good interest rate? Uh, yeah, yeah, pretty good. It's it's okay, but you, you do it short term. So if, if the interest rate is high, then you do it short term. You don't go for a long term interest rate. And uh, you choose a fixed one, so that way you know what you're getting to. So mm-hmm. in case there's an increase, then well, you're safe for that two years. But knowing that now how uh, the world go- world financial system is going, like all the rate hikes from that Federal Reserve, which after that the Bank of Canada follows up and kind of follows all the time with the U.S. Well, yeah, everyone does. <laughs> everyone does. Everybody follows the Federal Reserve, so we all know about American politics. And of course, when the Fed decides to hike up, everybody hikes up. And now we're seeing that he wants to slow down the hikes and then plateau. So now it's like, okay, two year time frame. It's a good opportunity to take because maybe after that two years, then that's when I'm going to see maybe I, it's, worst, worst case scenario is going to be the same or yeah. it's going to be lower. Yeah, it's very interesting. I mean, you're from Poland, so you probably have a bit of expertise as well. But coming from Brazil and seeing what you guys in the U.S. and Europe and Canada call uh, high inflation or <laughs> high interest rates, 
it's actually kind of funny because we're used to interest rates and inflation so high that for us it's like a, a, a drop in the bucket, you know. I know, man. I it's crazy because you gotta know that they keep it low because they want people here to be in debt. You guys have that. I know abroad in Europe, they don't have that culture to getting in debt. Really, like it was once you, there was a, people that were telling me, it's like, quite using a credit card. It was like, it's a credit card. I have a 30 day grace period to pay it back. The people was like, man, you pay the interest right away. It's like, what? The, what? <laughs> people were telling me that. It's like, once you swipe your credit card, you pay the interest right away. I was like, oh my God, that was a total shocker for me when I figured that out when I was uh, 18 traveling around in Europe and they told me that god but it's just this this culture of overspending here in America that they I think they purposely did it so that interest rates remain low so that people overspend and that of course what hits the hardest is when those interest rates go up because people are just already used to paying interest rates here a lot of them are paying uh the net, the minimum balance or oh. uh, just the, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm telling you that. It's, it's the, and I know people, so it's like, it's crazy how if you know people, then you, you know, some people are hiding that. So just that, uh, it, it's crazy that um, people are accustomed to this uh, overspending and uh, getting to debt. And, uh, yeah, everything is payments, obviously. Like, uh, pay your refrigerator in 65 uh, payments. Pay your car in 84 months. It's it's this uh, recurring cycle. It's like, well, don't worry. You don't have the money right now. You have a job? All right, let's go. And you know how the subprime crisis worked. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it was really lenient. Very lenient. And things didn't change too much, did they? No. No, the banks didn't learn the lesson. And who cares? They made money. Those CEOs yeah. and CFOs, they're, they're just dirt rich right now because they got yeah. bailed out. Yeah, they got they the actually, golden parachutes. and Yeah, yeah. They shorted the whole thing, so they made money. And now we got what we got with the housing market. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's lots of people, entrepreneurs, trying to quickly regain what they lost because they probably also fell in that hole and they didn't really uh, meet the demand with their supply and of course uh, lots of overbidding as well there was this competition of people who were waiting and bidding for housing honestly like big time especially during COVID where people wanted to buy a property outside of the city so they can have fresh air because they, mm -hmm. the cities when you were confined i think we were confined here for like um, at least a like an intense confinement i think it was a year a lot of people decided well since i'm working remotely since i'm you know not really enjoying being in the city like i enjoyed it people decided to buy properties outside in the nature be able to be like 10 minutes away from a ski resort or um uh, golf resort whatever and uh, enjoy it that way yeah you know this got me an interesting question for you Go because ahead. since you are a city planner and we do have those things not only because of the pandemic but also there was a bit of a paradigm shift towards mobile work or working for from home and many people realize that, yeah, they could live somewhere else. They don't have to pay those absurd rents that they would in a major city. So why not live 100, 200 kilometers from work, tops? Or even, depending on the job, you don't have to go. You never have to go to, to the office. So being working with city planning in a major city... Do you guys ever think of this dynamic that maybe there could be an urban a dehydration of the urban center sometime? Maybe not soon, but someday this might happen. No, there's um, too much of these uh, 
cultural and social um, magnets that exist. You have, you know, the sporting arenas, the theaters, uh, the um, uh, historic quarters, these tourist attractions, and it's never going to die. And also, it, there will always be if somebody decides to move out, then somebody will move in. There will be this exchange. And there's the thing is, is that there's more people wanting to move in than people moving out also. Mm -hmm. And the remote work, what's fascinating is that, um, I even heard a short cast today about remote work in Canada. And most of the remote workers are people that uh, work for a governmental uh, for the governmental sector. Really? Because they, yeah, because they they're able to. Of course, during the confinement, uh, I think it was uh, the the federal government was shut down for like a while, and everybody had to work remotely. And they, you know, there were the people that were uh, imposing the restrictions and the lockdown, so they had to set the example. Of course, for the postal service, all the government services, the parliamentary sessions, they had to set that example. And um, now it's mostly in um, the area around Ottawa and as well Montreal, where there's a lot of these uh, governmental uh, workers that are still doing a lot of remote work compared to other sectors in the economy. And that's because, well, they realized, well, why the hell do I have to commute? <laughs> it's like I can do my job. I have the laptop you're giving me, and I can do my job perfectly well with the, on the phone. And uh, I don't see why I, I have to go like five times a week into the office. And uh, people have now this leverage because it's became as well as a prime for uh, certain companies to kind of also allow remote work compared to other places. So. If you have one employer that's going to say, "Well, I'm going to limit, uh, I'm going to el eliminate remote work," then people are just going to be like, "Well, I'm just going to change jobs. Just I'm going to go to this job where they promised me at least three times a week remote work or completely remote, and I'm going to do that because what is the point of commuting? What is the point of earning, going to work to earn money, to spend money, to transport myself to go to work to earn money, and you know, this cycle. You know, this, a lot of people figure that out and are like." And now it's 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 gonna be a thing to stay honestly, and I see it on the roads. It's crazy. Mondays and Fridays are the easiest commute. Go on Wednesday, <laughs> holy hell, <laughs> it's jammed. Yeah, man. And it's it's interesting <laughs> to think because, like we were mentioning before, before we started recording, even there are many concerns with climate change. And one of the main things about this is the energy expenditure, basically. And commuting is a huge part of that. So shouldn't we be pushing towards more remote work? Because uh, you have to understand the mentality of the employer as well. There is also a benefit to having people on site a benefit to having people uh, interact with each other in real person. You get a systematic and organizational culture and community that gets facilitated and developed by having these uh, interpersonal interactions with uh, your colleagues and your, 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 um, your other, um, well, other supervisors and et cetera, and the organization. So, they, they they still want to have people they want to promote having on on site work for having this organizational culture and um, yeah just doing a culture organizational culture via zoom calls and uh, team meetups is very difficult honestly so it does help in that monitoring as well task it helps them with that as well i would be completely for doing remote work to resolve the transportation issues but um the other solution is investing in public transit alternative modes of transportation so that people can go and use them it would be so awesome 
honestly. And we know a few people that just work remotely. Like we've met some people on X that don't need to commute. Uh, they just do their uh, their X time or they do their nine to five at work and uh, they're able to just, uh, you know, live life like that. So it's um it's really a shame because the it's not really the pollution that worries me in the emissions, but it's also that mental fatigue you get from that commute as well. Yeah. Like I, I hate driving in traffic. I hate it. Really. Like my only way to cope is to just turn on a podcast and just take it easy, you know. You know, okay, go leave early as well leaving early is a great freaking tactic but um i that's why i I always prioritize taking the bus because i'm able to be on my phone read a book uh, be really focused on my own thing even maybe take a nap quickly whatever it's 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 free to do whatever i want but like driving man people that do it every day i'm like how do you guys do it man you you get frustrated and imagine having children in the back having to you have to drop them to kindergarten go to school and then they, they just like uh, complain the whole time and then you have like phone calls to do at the same time it's it's a stressful environment honestly like uh, it's that um, mental drain that's really more um, the issue for me because after that well that's that's how you start your day <laughs> it's really how you want to start your day be yeah you're already from stressed. going there yeah you, sometimes you don't even want to go and you're already stressed when you get there. And then when after the whole day working, you have to get on the car and get back home and another stressful hour or two. Yeah, it starts adding up. It does. And it really is. it's no wonder that we have such a dopamine crisis like our friend Coach Jacob yeah. likes to talk about. Because people need to escape from this. They're overstressed, overworked, overcommuted. Quite exactly. Quite exactly. They're too overstressed, honestly. Yeah. But alternative forms of transportation are cool, but they're expensive. They're really expensive. Just to service everybody would be an astron- astronomical bill to pay. And uh, it still wouldn't satisfy the needs of every individual because not everybody has to go from point from not everybody starts from the same point A and not everybody's going to go to the same point B where we all have our different networks, uh, all like our commute to work, our commute to the grocery, our commute to the school, our commute to the uh, grandma, grandpa's commute to the parents. And we all have our little networks and the the whole transportation network is all laid out so that we all can figure out how to get to our different destinations. And that makes our network and um, congestion as I see it is really a, um, an over uh, uh, outspur of demand and the supply that's uh, given. And the outspur of demand is the people that need to, move along a highway and the supply is the capacity of the highway or the street and it's just the well congestion happens when you have the demand exploding the supply and um, this is how I actually love to approach some arguments that I have with cities is a lot with the question of supply and demand like we, we talked about housing it's it's a mm-hmm. uh, it's a supply and demand issue it's uh, traffic and congestion and transportation is a tr- supply and demand issue as well and it's it's a lot of economics in, to take into consideration and um, it's like money as well this the price of something is based on supply and demand and sometimes that supply and demand is going to be driven with emotion and it's the same thing with uh, the question of housing the question of transportation it's our emotion our preferences that decide on what we're going to do next yeah at the end of the day we are still very emotional animals as though we like to think that we are rational we're not rational at all exactly but 
A thing that's interesting about traffic, it's that it's not linear at all as well. Like an increase in 10% of the cars doesn't make an increase of 10% in traffic. It's not linear. Like if you increase 50%, you have like four times as low as I, I don't remember if it's quadratic or what it was, but it's, it's quite, it's not so, um, how do we say it? It's, um. It's a bit counterintuitive sometimes, yes. some of these things. But as you were speaking about this, I was thinking there are some examples of cities that do manage to have a network that, of course, you never can be able to get all point A's and point B's for every person, right? But at the same time, you can have a network that with various modes of transportation, you can have a very efficient transportation that you don't even need to use a car for instance yeah. in tokyo they have this network that's very interchangeable between commuter trains and the metro and buses and bicycles and going on foot and they have many modes of transportation and many people don't even see the need of having a car and as a city planner what are the challenges that you guys face when you're thinking about pl planning the city or changing the zoning or changing the transportation, what are the main challenges you guys have? It's, um, I'm gonna go on that example with Tokyo because that's an actual thing I love to a analogize. And I don't understand actually with car culture in America and how also Americans hate monopolies, like having various modes of transportation available at your disposal that's that i see it as a competitive market it's various modes competing to have right different ride shares riderships actually and users and what the understanding in america is that the car is king and we allow having the car as the monopoly of our transportation system. That's how we developed. And whenever we come with the proposition of doing a, a train line, bus line, whatever, there's no interest in using that whatsoever. Even if you're saving time, even if you caught, if you you're saving money, even if it's maybe faster, it's um, it's a weird thing because it's it all goes to that comfort. And that's gonna well establish with these challenges that we face. It's a lot of people want to have their comfort. A lot, of, a lot of people want their security, their convenience. It's convenient to own a car, to be able to carry your stuff, your either your your tools, the baby carriage, the groceries. It's it's very convenient. It's safe because you are. Uh, protected at all four sides by metal and fiberglass and plastic. It's um, convenient, safe, and what was the third element I said? Sorry. No maps. Um, and it's the same thing with housing as well. We want... Well, safe housing is a, is a must. You, you want to be in a safe place. Honestly, you want to feel like home. Okay? You don't want people to get in and out and be robbed and whatever. But convenience is, of course, to uh, not run out of space. Feel like you can have anything you want in it. You can have the five, five screen, five uh, TVs, the three Xboxes, and uh, the garage with for storage for two cars. It's really this um, fear as well of missing space, feeling clustered, and. Mm -hmm. People think that when you want density in housing, that it has to be like skyscrapers and ap uh, uh, apartment blocks and you only have a balcony. But there's a lot of um, awesome projects that are really redefining how density is pictured, honestly. I've actually, one great example I love to take out from this book is this one cool building that's called the Eight House. 
by in Copenhagen. It's this sort of big, huge structure that's in the shape of an eight. Mm-hmm. And it's cool because it has this awesome modularity of various Oh, that's apartments. nice. And it's not like one story, one apartment, three three rooms in standardized across the whole structure. They have a um, very diverse mix of different dwellings so they can accommodate diverse uh, people, families, mm-hmm. uh, people that are alone, singles, couples, uh, families of four or five people. And um, do I have? Maybe if you want, you can actually pop um, onto the screen a few pictures of the eight house in in um, I think it's it's in Copenhagen, Denmark. Uh, if you're gonna do some editing, it would be cool if uh, you can show it to like the viewers. I don't know yeah, if you I do think, that kind of I stuff. I think we can show the screen here and oh, cool. Yeah, I never did this before, so it's the first time. Yeah. But what's cool about this building, and I, I, I went to see it when I was... I, I saw it from afar in um, when I was in Copenhagen. But what's cool about it is that it's also incorporated with this walkway slope along uh, the whole um, courtyard. So people are not, like, obliged or actually they don't have to go into a lobby, into the elevator shop, go up the elevator, into the corridor, and then enter the home. They're actually accessing their home from the outside. So you feel like you're actually like in the property, in the, in the terraced home. And it's a, it's a cool project, honestly, made by a big architecture that uh, they've been um, very innovative. It's really, the slope is designed so that it's not too steep, that you can actually go up and ride up with your bike. And bring it to your front yard that's in the buildings. The wow, building. that's so cool. That's a freaking and, awesome. And building. they even have some grass over here yeah. on the, the corner. So it's like a square, something like that. Yeah. A little park. Everybody yeah, has it's, a yard. It's quite interesting. Everybody, every unit has a yard. Everybody can have a garden. Oh, over here, all the little units have exactly. a little yard. Exactly. That's then? that slope. So you have the entrances mm-hmm. and. You have those little brick, uh, small brick walls that at least you have your intimacy between yards and you can have that communal space on that slope, which is a replication of a street. And you have your front yard, which is a set, which gives a setback from that street. And you have your lofts and different apartments that it's, of course, uh, you have numerous shapes and sizes in there that. You don't have only one single population living in that project. And that's what creates like diverse, uh, diverse uh, neighborhoods, these kind of uh, structures. And it's right next to a train station as well. So people can uh, bike to the train station or walk. Yeah, but going back to America. Yes. Like you said, people love the car. And I think one of the big reasons for that stems from American individualism. So how can you reconcile this with living with people from very diverse backgrounds? Because although I also am all for it, I know you are, but for people that love the car because they can have their own safe bubble, maybe they wouldn't be willing to live with people who they deem as different from them. Reconcile this kind of social problem as well with the housing problem, as well with people that would buy those apartments and how can we reconcile all of these facets? A tough question, honestly, because it depends on individual um, tolerance very much. Because I don't know why people are just like, um, people don't want to be living in the same building or be neighbors with a family. It's like, it's a family, man. You also have been part of family. How you want to, like, come on. It's normal that you hear kids scream just the once in a while playing outside, and that annoys you, man. Like, come on. Um. Eventually, also, they're gonna have to, well, suck it up because well, they're gonna have a family of their own. I'm talking about a younger person, of course, and um, it's um, 
it's very case to case. And I feel like there's just been this um, lost sense of community. Yeah. Of, of facts. And I see it very... We live in odd times because we go on online platforms and we love being part of communities. But we talk about, you know, the normies that don't go on X, that don't be in the internet that much. And well, they're, them, their their sense of community isn't really like, they're not thirsty for that. And I don't, I don't know why. It's I know hard why. To be a... That, you think? They're doom scrolling so much as... that they don't even remember they could be inside a community, maybe. The the TV. The, the TV way how as they well. perceive that world through Netflix. that screen gives that mm -hmm. perception of how the world is. The way how they're filled, they're given that information, how they consume that information gives them that portrait of how people are. Yeah. And a lot of they, us versus them. Yes, there's that. There's a lot of division, honestly. They talk, they characterize and put labels on people saying that they're the kind of these people, they are this trait, they have no interest, they want you eliminated, they don't want to have anything to do with you. So you say to yourself, well, if they don't want anything to do with me, then I don't have to do anything about them. And, um, it's, it's crazy how technology can help us, but not help us at the same time. It depends how you use it, honestly. It's, it's, yeah, I think it's we're crazy still stupid. adapting to this technology paradigm because it's very unhuman if you think of it. So many things that we kind of take for granted with technology, but they're so unnatural. <laughs> Like just being able to speak to you like 10,000 kilometers away, pretty much with no lag. It's so amazing if you think of it. If yes. you went 200 years back and told someone that you could do this, they'd think you're a wizard. Exactly. But now it's, it's normal. We, we do it. Yeah, we do it <laughs> every day and it's normal. And if we have a little lag, we freak out already. Mm -hmm. I think we're maybe we're a bit spoiled with technology we are but at least we're you using our spoiler in a good way in my sense in my in my opinion i might be completely wrong depending on who's gonna listen and i think that it, it's just we also took the time to listen to that's what a lot of people a lot of people can hear, but not a lot of people can listen. And I think that's also a kind of a problem with also uh, not wanting to belong in a community because it also takes a lot of effort to listen, to know what troubles other people, hear their concerns. Of course, you don't have to be agreeable with everything, but at least to be, to listen to somebody is at least a, good form for you to be part of a community and it also facilitates speaking in my opinion as well because um, a lot of people hear here and then eventually they a lot of people have the freaking trouble of just speaking as well like they just speak 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 and it's like nobody's listening to you <laughs> they they expect just everybody to listen to them but then they're not listening people are not listening and they're, they're frustrated that nobody listened and then, then, then in exchange they don't listen so it's just this like loop entrapment loop of uh, just people not being able to to listen and to speak and be heard and let, be listened and it doesn't really make a flourishing recipe for a community yeah i think you bring a, an interesting point that people are losing their communication skills and building a community is basically com communication at the end of the day it's yeah 
fostering those relationships between the people in that community. And I mean, of course, it might be biased, but it seems like the younger the people get, the worse their communication skills are getting because they're so used to being all the time on their phones or on TV or whatever it is. And yeah, it's, it's interesting to think how things will be. I hope that we can do a bit of a shift towards a world with people that don't lose totally the social mm -hmm. aspect and the communication skills because at the end of the day, we still crave human interaction and we want to buy things from people that we like. We want storytelling is so important because it's the main way that we were that we evolved to communicate yes. so there are many aspects that are inherently human but we're sort of i wouldn't say losing our humanity but for instance they just launched that apple had headset yes. the vr thing and did you see those videos man i saw alex spins videos and they were freaking hilarious <laughs> are you gonna buy it I'm not gonna buy that first version for sure. I'm not gonna be able to tolerate the, the neck pain. But um, the spatial computing looks interesting, especially for what um, I want to do with it. I would love to be able to use it in order to plan in situ virtually. Oh yeah, that would be cool. I would. I would be like instead of spending my time in front of a computer to design a lot, to remake a street, redesign a street, I would wear that headset and I would literally draw into the sky mm -hmm. what I want and what I envision to really be at the moment, to feel it and really go to that immersive experience of augmented reality. Of Yeah, exactly. That's uh, that's the kind of um, use case that would be awesome to have for that, but that first version is too bulk. It's too bulky. It it has a two and a half hour battery life. It's very big and fat, and uh, my eyes are already sensitive by the time we spend in, in front of screens. I'm pretty sure I'm gonna go blind after one year. Yeah, that's one of my main concerns about eye health and how that's going to be. But uh, to be honest, I didn't even, oh, come it's on, done. man. Your I, eyes are gone. It's, it's, it's the direct blue light rays that go into your eyes and it's sensors that are sensing your eye movement at every millisecond. I don't want that. <laughs> it's not just, it's not just like screen rays. It's, it's other type of rays that might be even more stronger than that, I bet. Mm -hmm. And it could be much more damaging and like just scanning your eyes every moment. So it's like that. Um, it's it's like that little light in your remote uh, remote control that's kind of but all the time kind of directly. Fine. Exactly, exactly. So I'm not I'm not down for that. They make it in in the sense that it's low light. They make like a say a, a Kindle. A paper version of that yeah, okay yeah maybe and make it as big as a pair of sunglasses and yeah it's it's interesting but <laughs> early adopters are the lab rats <laughs> exactly and they they're the test pilots for apple to 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 to, to value it for the next product <laughs> yeah maybe version three or four will be really cool but yeah man you were talking about a very interesting use case and you know there are things there are similar things that are already used in industry so there's a thing called industry 4.0 and they're already used for a similar use case that you said that you would plan a city they can have a virtual rendition of a factory or you can do research and development and you can see the things in augmented reality but as something to the masses, at least something that has the potential to become mainstream, I guess this one is the first. Yeah, it's 
it's the same technology, just a different scale. Because that's what's cool about it. It's spatial computing. You're able to, um, you're able to anchor certain functionalities and apps in certain locations, and that's what I find cool as well. Is that some point Apple is gonna be really intense on ads? I believe. Mm. Like I talked to this in one space that the use case of um, AR is going to be that you're going to have blank walls, uh, underutilized um, surfaces that are going to be converted to digital advertisement spaces, like we've seen in the uh, in metaverses in uh, Web3, that you have people that are buying plots of land at space in the metaverse to do an ad for McDonald's, Nike, Adidas, and those companies are paying for those ads in that metaverse to showcase their brand. And um, I see it in, that was just a test pilot for the augmented reality case that's going to be in the future where I think there's going to be personalized ads for every user that's going to be based on their digital identity, their algorithm of their consumption patterns, of their spending patterns. And they're going to have these very uh, triggered ads like we have on the side of our social media and pages or like Facebook and LinkedIn. We have these ads that are... We, we talked about something the other day. Uh, we talked about wanting a new pair of shoes. And then apparently two days later, we have a pair of shoes on sale right down the top. It's, that's what's going to happen. And it's going to be look, it's going to be fixed on the location. So it's also going to tell you that, well, the next store is half a kilometer away in that direction. So while you're here, you might as well go and you have a rebate. So take, and they're going to put a timer. So it's going to be like, if you want it, you're going to have to go now. Yeah. You know, they already do that kind of thing, but not on the metaverse scale. Like the other day, I bought a pizza through one of these food apps here yeah. in Brazil. It's called iFood. <laughs> so I bought a pizza and then as soon as I bought it, I got like a timer for one hour and it was like, you have a uh, pretty high discount and no um, delivery fee for anything that you order in the next hour, something like yeah. that. You like it's a no brainer to use it. I didn't use it just out of spite because they're like, they're making a video game out of ordering food now. Yeah, they're gamifying everything. They're gamifying the virtual world, the consumption habits so that you don't gamify your life by success, succeeding and trying to level up by yourself. They, they want you to get that, those dopamine hits, those, um, that satisfaction through consumption rather than fulfillment. Coach Jacob would be so proud of you, man. I, I I know about the hormones, man. So <laughs> he's a cool dude as well, man. I should meet up with him as well about this stuff because it's it's crazy how we're just uh, big dopamine chasers. And he did, uh, I think it was in Crystal Space, he did talk about uh, the fact that um, future generations are going to get more depressed because yeah. they're so addicted to having these dopamine rushes and Depression is literally when you have a digression of mm -hmm. uh, dopamine and you don't have any satisfaction or pleasure from the regular kind of small things that uh, really are um, fulfilling for your life. And uh, that's also the kind of end the cycle with uh, pornography as well. Like people watch crazy shit and then when they go to a relationship, they expect to do that stuff they saw in the screen and it's not uh, porn and real sex life is not the same. It's absolutely not. And uh, mm -hmm. they have problems with erectile dysfunction. They have problems with lubrification. They have 
big issues with that kind of stuff and it creates um a unfertile society yeah yeah i think maybe that one that example is maybe the most known or the tip of the iceberg but there are so many other things that are happening right now regarding this because of course pornography is a very old thing it used to be those little like sailor cards or little yeah. magazines but now it's so widespread and you can get it at any time at any moment with whatever type of people or even not only people concoction but there are also other problems regarding dopamine with yeah. social media with normal media as well with so many things food and like you said people end up not gamifying their own lives using things like exercising or doing the things that they should be doing studying working they end up craving those little dopamine spikes that come from outside sources inside of us in, instead of the things that they should be doing that's the inside sources depression is just a imbalance of our neurochemistry especially dopamine but not only that and if you are constantly on a spike when you get to the to the low that's the, the normal actually it will feel like you're getting over here instead of here mm -hmm. so you feel depressed but you're not even actually clinically depressed you're kind of dove your own grave exactly that's what people laugh at is like oh, that's not an existing condition it is just that the existing condition is that over over dose of dopamine it's like a it's like a drug as well it's uh, when you take too much of it you overdose and enough that when that high goes that way then you probably you're still high probably but you've got accustomed to that higher dose that you just are used to that higher dose and then after you just a a never-ending slope of you augmenting your doses and just uh, going uh, for more and more and once you feel that like uh, normality or soberness you're craving for more and I got this by watching that series painkillers like I watched the two versions of that series recently another series uh, that was available on streaming that was also uh, the same story with Purdue Pharma about uh, Oxycontin so it's yeah, crazy wasn't how... there a movie as well yeah you know, they, they oh, documented is it a movie, so right? intensely that Pharma uh, Purdue Pharma story it's crazy it is it is and it's not the only crazy story with American pharmaceutical or health companies or even food companies as well america is a very messed up place no it's just a, it's the land of the free yeah free to do whatever you want free to sell whatever you want yeah free to make money at the expense of people's people. well-being yeah yeah exactly that's, that's that's what's crazy man it's uh to the thing that's always um, the issues that we have is a constant struggle of balancing our emotions. That's the root of the problem is that people are not really in sync with the emotions that they have. That's deep. It's... Yeah. To be very honest, all of the problems that we've mentioned so far are very deep and full of intricacies that they're not easy to solve. No. And if your whole line of work is about solving problems that are not trivial because there are so many stakeholders, so many things that you need to think about. But getting back a little bit to the virtual side of things, when you okay. mentioned the blockchain and Web3, and on your bio on X, you have, do planners and mayors know about the blockchain? And... I think this is a subject that 
that you could really nerd out about and that could be really interesting like what's the use of real estate in the metaverse or whatever we shall call it this virtual yeah. reality thing and yeah basically how could this be useful and yeah man just nerd out i've been in crypto for four years now and i approached it the same kind of way as i approached my master's degree by doing a lot of academic research like when i was uh at the end of my degree i still had access to the databases mm -hmm. of um, various um, sources and i was like picking everything up you know i was like I'm going to graduate soon. I might as well like pack my bag as with as much articles mm -hmm. as possible. And I, I learned a lot about the uh, blockchain technology, Bitcoin decentralization, the Web3. And uh, I was also, that was the primary reason why I also went on X because I knew that that was the place where all the Web3 was going on. Like I, there was nothing on Instagram. They were just flexing the gains you were getting from Doge and Sheep and all the meme coins and, and all the rallies. And, um, of course there were also those, uh, there was also on Reddit as well. I was going a lot on Reddit, getting educated about that too, and really like picking pieces up of knowledge, like the, the academic uh, sources. Then I would listen to a few, uh, YouTubers about the topic as well. And then some I'll be like, well, this, this guy's full of, uh, mm? and this guy is at least talking with some sense and it makes a good comprehension of the thematic so i should listen to this guy and i i didn't really like um take uh into granted one person i didn't trust one person but i took the opinions of various people about the topic and i built my own on it and um a use case for um metaverse i think it's a playground honestly to have a tester for how assets could be tokenized on a the blockchain because the blockchain is a it's a digital ledger of um, various transactions that are uh, all put into blocks that are encrypted so every block is encrypted and every encryption if you want to go to a specific block if you want to say like hack a, the blockchain you would have to be able to decrypt every single block that's new while it's still being generated and encrypted in order to do a mutization of the transaction. So that's why it's immutable because it's so complex, the cryptography in that system, in that ledger, it's secure. Like everything, that's why people say the blockchain doesn't lie. It's a really, uh, it's a trustworthy um technology that enables to have full transparency in what occurs as a transaction between uh, one party and another party without having a middleman which is like the credit card companies the banks and the hedge funds or other uh, in, uh, money services actually not hedge funds and um, i think metaverse is a way to play around like we did with NFTs, the non-fungible tokens. And of course, items in the metaverse were also sold as NFTs uh, too. Uh, and the NFT craze was mostly, and I heard it in the space, it was just us fucking around with a bunch of JPEGs to see what the technology can do. And we managed to make money out of it. It was I literally heard those words like, well, this was, was all about. It's not actually add value. You guys didn't value art. <laughs> you guys were just speculating. That's what you were guys doing. The same thing with the with the dot com bubble, and it was just basically playing around with the market and literally having a game of emotional tag of transferring money, getting money from the impatient, so that the patient can get a buck. And uh, that's uh, actually that's how um, that's how Warren Buffett actually um, described it as uh, the market's work is is the transfer of wealth from the impatient to the patient, and that's how they utilize it. They played with uh, a lot of hype, a lot of narratives 
saying that the, this project has this promise and it's going to go to that value and people were emotional about it and they got that uh, fear of missing out, FOMO, we call it. And also, fortunately, people also wanted to make more money, so they got greedy. And it's really that um, balance between uh, being fearful and greedy as well in uh, investing. And uh, a lot of people were playing around with that technology to just speculate. I see um, the creation of worlds in a metaverse is a way to have a value for those games that we talked about earlier um, in the um, the conversation of uh, spending several hours trying to gain that legendary item, that mythical item, and that when, uh, of course, you have that item, there's no value actually attached to that item except for maybe the in-game currency and there was actual work done to get that item and since there is the blockchain that permits uh, you to record the amount of activity the gameplay that you did every click that you did it records it with that then you have the work was done and there was proof of work for getting to that objective. Thus, it should. It, there's a certain value to that item because that work was done, and people are able to make money out of it. I don't know if you've. Um, I think the first time that people were actually paying cash, actual money to get in-game items, was with um, Counter Strike. Mm-hmm. People were buying guns from people that were like, uh, they already had like this certain level up gun, a certain persona, they would sell uh, people, uh, they would sell to other people, other items and characters. I remember also at World of Warcraft as well, people were already selling like a certain X level uh, personas to other people for a couple hundred dollars so that they can just bypass uh, having to work for getting that item or that level. And um, that's what's probably the um, big, big, big uh, promise with the metaverse and uh, gaming in uh, Web3 is justly that, is to be able to create economies within those systems of really giving value to games and to really make money out of it. And people mm -hmm. are going to be making money out of uh, playing 20 hours of uh, video games and making more money than actual people who generate real, real world value into this world. Who actually work. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a, this is a crazy time, honestly. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It makes you, it makes you want to like, just say, well, what, let's just quit my job and play video games. But where's the... the where is the merit in that? Honestly, where is the merit? Where is that like sense of accomplishment of doing oh, so? Like, it's all about the clicks, man. Your brain about, doesn't know the difference. Doesn't know, man. It's it's really no sense of merit because even when people they become successful and they have all this money, some like even having all that money, some people witness that. Well, I still don't feel fulfillment. Like I've got this, this rich, but I don't have a family, I don't have children, I don't have uh, friends anymore because I just spend my whole time working and getting this uh, this whole uh, money and just focusing on my career. And then after they just, um, well, they kind of regret it all, say. Yeah, but that kind of thing happens in all careers, to be honest. So not only for professional gamers. Oh, yeah, in all careers, that's exactly what I meant. Like, uh, even a, a person that got rich by doing uh, real estate flips and working uh, 80 hours a week for five years, or a person that started his company and worked his ass off, and but he did not have this uh, work-life balance, then they, I heard a lot of testimonies of people just saying, like, well, 
if I would have just done a little bit differently, I would have just maybe like uh, at least started a family and uh, not focus that much on my career. Yeah, there's, I won't remember the exact quote, but it's something like, no one will remember all of those hours, extra hours you put on work, all of those weekends you worked, except your family, Exactly. your wife, your kids, they will remember, but your boss, he won't care. He won't remember one month from now, he won't give a shit. So Oh, you think so? on average. I think it happens a lot that, especially with people getting older, when they pass like 40, 45, they start getting too expensive for the company. And sometimes a guy worked his ass off 10 years for the same company and they still kick him out. So I've seen this happen a lot in, on the real estate market. And it's a bit heart heartbreaking because there are guys who already have kids, who have like a family and everything. And yeah, it's a bit. But yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. It is what it is, honestly. And yeah, the, those layoffs are pretty hard, honestly, because it's... It's crazy how people sometimes like give these examples of like work hard and you you it'll pay out, and it's just um, fucked in how you can get really down on your luck, and really that's gonna happen. Just okay, well thanks for the thing and ciao. Like oh my god, what? All that blood, sweat, and tears, man, for just getting laid off afterwards. That's um that's a constant fear as well for me because I feel like I've had that happen to me in my student job too and I don't want that happening again because I really had a sense that if I would have stayed there and it was a good paying job honestly uh it's just I I had cues of knowing that I wouldn't level up. into a certain Mm-hmm. respond more responsibility better pay they they were keeping me there honestly and because it was convenient for them because there was a labor shortage of people that Mm. were qualified as me so that's why i'm happy in my career right now Yeah, but but so far it has paid off, hasn't it? it does it does i it just i wish i would have done it sooner Because Mm. uh, I know I would have had much more fun, too. And who knows I would have, where I would have been already today. Who knows where you'll be five years from now, anyways. Exactly. I, I want to be really somewhere different. Really. Like, real estate is looking like a cool option for me. Because I've... Um, I have this, um, I did social sciences with mathematics in, in college. And I did also focus a lot on uh, e economies too, and knowing how economies work. And also seeing everything in the whole planning lens, I see it through economics. And uh, it's astounding how sometimes I get into a conversation with people that are looking for a property and I go and I give them the pointers of saying, well, do you know that there are plans to build a tram line in that area? Do you know that they're going to build a um, commercial real estate uh, development right there? You know, they're going to do the whole uh, redo the whole street and the whole route and they're going to do a bike lane that's going to go see across the city and that's kind of what is kind of leaning me towards that because helping people find a home is a, a, is going to be always in demand because Yeah. uh, brokers uh, sorry uh, uh, realtors They are really awesome to facilitate the transaction. They, they help the clients and the sellers a lot.
in uh, all the little patras and uh, paperwork, I would say. And uh, I'm, I used to just talk about potential real estate plans with uh, in school with my friends and like actually visiting a neighborhood that's really um, under appreciated and seeing mm -hmm. the potential of appreciation for that neighborhood and just like that we're gonna be the we're gonna be the gentrifiers here and we're gonna just make the blocks go higher and higher and like we were joking of course mm -hmm. they're becoming the bad guy <laughs> yeah, exactly but we knew it's like you know your enemy and you become it <laughs> yeah but it's, that's how the system is it's just that it's um it, it at some point it's just that you gotta be able to fend for yourself but i know that i would be at least knowledgeable to make sure that people have the right make the right decisions or right choices and also to um innovate in the different kind of policies and maybe also promote them to also be more inclusive and uh, saying and doing the sacrifice of making like okay well i can at least lower my expected profit in order to give something affordable to somebody really in need and if they get that chance then it will be a very good benefit because it will be good in uh, your reputation of being someone resourceful and helpful and also to uh, really help yourself as well to be uh, somebody that could be um, a good reference as a problem solver too. Because the having a home is really a a fundamental right for my in my perspective in my view. Because if you don't have a home, how can you expect having a stable uh, profession? How can you expect to have a stable social life? How can you expect to have a just a, a stable development of your personality? you can't you, if you ha don't have a safe home a safe uh, situation then you are going to actually be in a state of anxiety yeah yeah it's maslow's hierarchy of, of needs if you don't have safety well, uh, if you don't uh, have food did you go through if... my phone because i was l actually looking at that this week really that's why there's policies for housing first because they know that the a stable home situation is the fundamental pillar of achieving a purposeful and really accomplished life or at least strive for that kind of life yeah and even if you don't think of the sociological part or the particular person but even from an economic standpoint, the interest of the government is that those people have their home so that they can actualize all of those lower levels so they can be able to work well, so they can be able to contribute as much as they can to society. Because if those people, they don't have a home, they won't sleep well, they won't be able to eat well, they will be on that constant state of anxiety to contribute the best version of yourself to society if you don't have the basic needs met. We've been able to monetize and make profit out of people's problems too. That's why we have wars. That's why we have a vested interest as well. Because I think that the trade-off, if we were to have homes for everybody, the trade-off would be that, and, and that is like in the perspective of somebody that already has it all is that people are going to take it for granted and that they're going to treat that home as not the way it's supposed to and they're not going to exercise that full potential and be a beneficial member of the society there are people that have a lot of baggage in their life and they're not able to 
uh, really participate in normal life. Like a lot of people go through all this shit, and it's hard. It's hard to go away from it and fix it. Those scars from the past, without like proper therapy, without proper um, reinstatement. And sometimes that for elites and people of power, the it's better off to maybe let them fend for themselves rather than just give an extra dollar or a few thousand dollars to fix up their situation. Yeah, I think we took a deep, a bit dark turn. I don't the care. last few minutes. <laughs> I really yeah. Don't care. <laughs> yeah, I don't care as well. If you want to go even deeper, I'm all in. <laughs> to be honest, I'm all in to anything in this podcast. Yeah, it's um, because also homelessness is a, it's a really interesting topic. Because have you ever seen how homelessness is depicted as an iceberg? Could you elaborate a bit more? You you may be able to find it on a Google image as well. It's um. The absolute, the, you know, the form of homelessness that we picture, a panhandler on the street corner with maybe um, dirty clothes, not have showered, you know, asking for change. That's the tip of the iceberg. While as there are many situations of homelessness that exist. And... The absolute homelessness is the one that we see day to day when we go to city centers. We see these people sitting on the street and um, laundering or in public spaces. But there is more underneath. There is homelessness that we do not see every day. And yeah, exactly. So that's like more like um, statistical. But you have a statutory homeless where they have temporary living accommodations where they would use, um, and also with hidden homelessness too, is um, people that utilize their social um, networks, friends, family, in order to have shelter. They they call up a friend. They say, hey, man, I, I can't. I can't pay for the shelter this night. Can I pro- can I just like crash at your place? Or they avoid going to the shelter by using their social networks exactly by just calling friends, family, and say, "Hey, can I stay at your place for a couple of days? I'm really down on my luck. I'm I'm kicked out. Uh, I'm not able to. I wasn't able to pay rent, so I go to this place. And after a while, certainly while people are fed up of having them, so they go to another transition and another transition." And um, yeah, that's that's what it's called, like hidden homelessness, uh, sofa surfing, living in hostels, and otherwise hidden homelessness. And then there's, um, of course, people that are at risk of homelessness that spend more than fifty percent of their income or rent, and they live or they live in the unsaleable housing. And that's kind of where a lot of people are at, due to the unaffordability of housing it really takes a bigger chunk of their budget to get shelter. And it gets really difficult for them to really have any possibility to save for a better future, to eat properly, to be able to commute to a potential job and they're fixated to a certain location. They're not able to sell their property in order to move out too. That's another situation that it's that diagram is very simplistic because of Mm -hmm. course every person's situation is different and it's just crazy how we think of homelessness as the guy at the corner of the street asking for change. That's just the tip. And a lot of people, even people that may we might know too live in a situation where they're moving around from place to place and being in paying too much money for temporary shelters like hostels. Uh, Going to a hostel for one month is way more expensive than renting an apartment. But however, it's a commitment day by day. Well, as an apartment, it's a commitment by long term. And if you don't have that income to do that long term commitment, if you uh, screwed up your credit score, 
and the landlord does refuses you and you're not able to find any rent, any apartment, then you're in the situation where you have to fend for yourself every day. Yeah. And it's uh it's a difficult task. It's very expensive to be poor actually because It is. It is. With all of these situations, not only with home but also with food, with everything really, you you can't get the the big package for anything you're going to buy so that you could use it for the whole month. You can't do that because it has to fit on a backpack or whatever you have. Everything you do, you can't get the better deal. You have to pay the more expensive option because you don't have any option. Yeah, exactly. You can only eat at a restaurant, get a sandwich. You can't buy a pack of bologna and a bunch of bread. You, you have to carry around with you. Unless if you just... Uh eat peanut butter sandwiches every day but that's not nutritious and even that way because things spoil you don't have a refrigerator or, or <laughs> in a cold place as well you don't have where to store your things your food if you're going to sleep in canada on in the middle of the winter there's no way you can sleep safely there is a way. outside some people do it i mean but it's not safe like, it's not safe but it's where it goes, where some people decide that when it's when it's a very ideal conditions outside, they um, they just decide to sleep outside because it's less costly. But when it's um, I, I remember when it's minus thirty, uh, they will they have that. Some of them actually have that extra money on the side, like a two hundred dollars, to at least get themselves a hotel room because they don't want to freeze to death. But at least they, like some do, um, and of course, the homelessness can be, as we said, like shit happens to people in life. Either it's mental illness, either it's a bad luck. They lost a job and they got to a downward spiral of that situation. But the ones that some of them have these like uh, very great instincts of survival in uh, making sure that they have a plan A and plan B, some are very lost and they only have what they go with. And uh, there are some that are organized that have money at least saved up in their sock, somewhere in their bag, just to make sure they don't get the, the, um, stolen as well. And uh, they're able to at least have, like, you know, a couple hundred dollars in case they have to get a hotel or motel room just so they can be of shelter uh, from the cold. Or... Uh, they don't abuse necessarily their social networks that much. And when they really ha are in big trouble, then they call them as in case of an emergency. Like mm -hmm. people manage to go and um, resolve these problems. Well, that's good to know, man, because here in Brazil, and we don't even get that much of a cold Like in the winter, it doesn't get that cold. But there are people that literally die frozen to death because they're sleeping on the street. It's sad. It's really it sad. Is. That's unfortunately the, the issue with capital. And the issue with uh, using housing as an investment in ve vehicle and a commodity. And... Um, we see it more, you're going to see more and more in the world how they are trying to make properties much more liquid as assets. Mm -hmm. You have the great example is um, in Manhattan, Billionaire's Row. Yeah. Th this is like the hyper, hyper. Uh, gentrification phase that the excessive one where they build skyscrapers with uh, one, two, three story lofts that are uh, very robustly constructed and isolated so you don't hear your neighbors. You have nice views, you're paying for the views. Like in social media, you pay for views, and <laughs> justly, and you you kind of like have this piece of real estate in a prime location, but by also not having any 
uh, interactions with other people in that building. They would, people would have private elevators. And there is one project, it's not a billionaire's role, but there's one project where it's literally a, uh, you drive into the building and your car goes up an elevator and you arrive in your flat. And these are like architectural incentives to make properties uh, much more faster to transact because you eliminate all of the kind of negative um, attributes of owning a property. You don't have a neighbor, you don't have the noise, you don't have uh, the um, nuisance of encounter with anybody. And this goes uh, really um, hand in hand with the kind of money, money laundering that uh, we talked about is that it's a fast transaction you can do that you can buy and sell the property just like you can uh, transact with a stock on the the exchange. Yeah, when you first started talking about liquidity, actually I thought you would go back a little bit to the blockchain and how you can tokenize real estate as well and um, like fractionalize yeah. it into little pieces and sell it to people so you can get one thousandth of a, an apartment, for instance, with a token. Mm, I wouldn't do that. I w that would be a good incentive to crowdfund an apartment, but I would just go to tokenizing a lot or a property. Yeah, for instance... if, unless if it's, if, I would see it in a case where if the apartment is purposely um, intended for short term rentals like Airbnb, where people want to have a cut on the uh the revenue of renting that state then yes i would see that but that that would be a holy hell of an extreme i think it first has to go to tokenizing uh, real world assets and making sure that it's used that one token one nft one um say um property uh, rights uh, agreement is on the blockchain so there's fast transaction and you don't need those middlemen and those uh, third parties to facilitate it but i could see how you can fractionalize it and really uh, invest in by many for an apartment man the legal the legal stuff oh my god that would be a court case nightmare. Yeah, I'll send you an example. There's this company in Australia. They are called BrickX. Yeah. And they sort of do this. They, they, I, I can put it on the screen so you take a look. Let's see. Learn how it works. So they fractionalize the properties in 10,000 units. They call them bricks. Then you can choose the bricks you want to buy. So the specific properties. We're kind of running an ad. And I just noticed this, but whatever. Yeah. It's just an interesting business model we're trying to figure out. So then it's it's basically a platform that you can buy fractions of the of the properties. And I, I'm not sure if they do short term rentals of it or if it's a more long term thing. But they they do like you buy one percent of an apartment, for instance, yeah. and then you get your cut of the revenue. Of course, they will charge you some sort of fee because they have to make their cut as well. Yes. But yeah, it's basically this. And when they sell the property, you get your cut of the capital returns as well. So maybe with new developments, this could be an interesting kind of model. Honestly, I would rather buy a, a fraction of a monkey jpeg than a fraction of a property <laughs> let's risk no but imagine the legal ramification of this if something breaks if a uh, fire occurs then you would be as a holder well your money is gone that's for sure unless you get insurance for that and of course if uh, some tenant 
of that short-term rent uh, property complains that there's not sufficient uh, services or there's a device in construction, then um, who's going to pay? Is it going to be the largest holder of the property? Is it going to be people, uh, everybody has to pitch in, uh, that's going to be weighed out by um, the amount you owe? And you're going to have least control. And if you also want to make renovations, but if, say, 51% of the holders do not want to do those renovations, then you got to keep it as is. It's a difficult way because it's either there's going to be just these votes every time for a decision. And it's going to be like shareholder votes, honestly. If uh, you're going to have to go and be obliged to pay when it's not exactly when your decision too you're gonna be it's gonna be some fishy tactics because people are gonna want to pay extra to renovate and people are not gonna want it to pay so they're gonna have to sell their portion cash out imagine if the liquidity is not there anymore who's gonna pay for that portion and of course, it's going to be also a dynamic of supply and demand between those fractionalized assets that if one sells at a lower price than what is actually marketed, then the price of everybody's share is going to go down too. Yeah. Everybody's going to be a loser. Yeah. Yeah, I think in a sense they're trying to imitate the REIT market, but with smaller properties and charging a smaller price Mm -hmm. because it's already wild just to be selling and buying in the market where it's all individualized lots but imagine fractionalizing each lot and doing a a, a selling and buying between the things within the same lot and that's going to affect the neighboring lot it's just going to be in a kind of an inception of investing it is it'd be a creation of a market within a market The market is going to be the whole real estate market and every aspect of that whole real estate market is going to be affected by the market of one lot. Yeah, in a way, wouldn't all markets work like that? In theory, at least. They do, but it's much simpler to... And this is something as well, like me, the people that I know in real estate is that they never they try as much as possible to avoid doing co-ownerships just because of that problem. Because you have to be sure that every party of that co-ownership agrees on the actions taken and it takes a longer time to do so. Yes, they might think that blockchain will be able to make it transparent and make it fast, but you're still in that in that dilemma that humans are going to decide. And they're going to decide based on their emotion, based on their fear that the price is going to go down, based on their fear that their investment is not going to get the return on investment that they expected. And some are going to be greedy as well on that. Yeah, and with co-ownership, I saw this a lot when it came to successions. Yeah. Because maybe, okay, it was all the fathers or the couples, and then they pass it on to a bunch of offspring. And then things get really ugly sometimes because one brother thinks he should be entitled to more or whatever is the case. There's always a fight. One wants to sell because he needs money. The other one doesn't want to sell because he wants it to appreciate more. And yeah, co-ownership is a mess, basically. Yeah, exactly. So if it's already a mess with two people, I wouldn't imagine with 10,000 people. Yeah. Yeah. You can't I mean, even probably. figure out our democracies <laughs> no way and, and fix up concurrent policies that we all agree upon. Imagine doing that at one lot. Yeah. Yeah, but I think this is one of the big problems as well. Not let's not go too much into conspiracy theories, but why <sighs> do they focus so much on policies that people couldn't agree upon and why don't we think of things that everyone would be in favor of like building more livable cities 
apart from a very small minority, albeit a minority that may have a lot of money, most people would be in favor of having more livable cities or having better quality air, better quality water. However, what we see in politics is mostly divisionism or trying to polarize around things that not necessarily should be the priorities. Well, there's a lot of... Um, it's easier to divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And it's also that clarity. Because you said livable city. Livable city could mean something different for me. Could mean something different for you. Could mean something different for your neighbor. Could mean that something different for the mayor. It's, it's, a, it's a really big buzzword because livable city would be okay i can be in and out from my garage get in my car and be able to go to work flawlessly to without traffic that's a livable city for somebody me a livable city is to be able to walk and get a carton of milk in 10 minute walk that's it and be able to go to work in a flawless uh, frequent transit line and to be able to uh, read and write while I do so. It's, um, and this is what mostly this problem with um, the planning profession is that they use a lot of buzzwords mm -hmm. that trigger different emotions for everybody. And also the perceptions that everybody has for those buzzwords is so different that once we get to the drawing table, we realize that we don't have the same ideas. And the same visions. So and that's that what's one important. Of, so that's one of the greatest challenges for city planning. Getting a consensus. To have a common vision. To set um, tangible and coherent goals. And to formulate policies that are constructive and move us forward. Uh, that's really like city planning is uh it's it's crazy when i approach it because people may not seem interested in what i talk about after they know me a bit and get to realize that what's going to be funny is that we have a lot of these people that are talking about personal growth and want to grow personally and all that and then Imagine if you get that six pack. Imagine you get that uh, six figure salary. Imagine you get it's um. A lot of people are gonna be be successful in their personal attainment. But however, after that, they're gonna have to strive for something bigger. And uh, I remember that like the sense of community. Especially when you're going to be attaining those uh, goals of yours, those personal set benchmarks that you set for yourself. Once they're attained, what's next? Well, you're going to be wanting to be part of a community that works. It's going to be successful. It's going to strive. And that community is going to be a stakeholder in your city. You're going to want your city to strive. And then after well, your city strives, you want your nation to strive. And then after you want the whole world to be striving. Sorry striving and i think that on what i'm doing is i'm kind of already setting the blueprint on what people might want to focus on later on in their life because these planning and planning cities and planning land use and communities it's like it's going to be that next level for a lot of people at, later on they're going to want to have that uh, influence. They're going to want to be able to bring the best of themselves to contribute. I agree with you. I agree that, especially with social media, I think this became more pervasive, that we have a very, not we, as in us two, and probably most of the people that might listen to this, but there's this sense that, being fulfilled is flying on a private jet, going on a yacht, having a Lamborghini, all of those things that, okay, they're nice. They might even be an art form in a way. 
because they're very interesting works by people that really know what they're doing, but they're just objects. Exactly. And at, at the end of the day, of course, there are objects, there are objective things that we need, like a home in a way is an object as well. But we need this sense of community. We need these roots. We need these connections. And they won't come. Or you may even attract people to your life because of how successful you are or your six pack or all of these things that or like your your best friends are not attracted to you to be your friend because of your physical appearance and even when you think of a partner whatever who's listening likes man woman it's not only about the looks of course you need to have some a certain sense of attraction towards their looks but it's also about their values about the person they are about how you feel around them about making each other laugh about being available to help each other in the best way you can. And this goes to other people in your life, to friends, to family, to kids. And that's what makes life fulfilling. All of these experiences, those relationships, not necessarily the material stuff, because when we're old in our deathbeds, we won't be thinking that much of those things, we will be thinking, oh, I'm so glad that so-and-so are here with me in this moment and that we were able to do all of those things. And money is important, but it's something, it's an end to a mean, not the mean itself. Exactly. It's, um, I think I, I, I'm going to quote somebody, but I, don't know who I'm quoting because I heard it in a podcast while doing other <laughs> things. But your fulfillment in life isn't reflected on the amount in your bank account, mm -hmm. but by whom is around your deathbed. That's beautiful, man. And I totally agree with that. Yeah, that's a... That's, uh... I'm quoting somebody, but I don't know whom. <laughs> I have to do my research. Yeah. It's it's so normal. <laughs> you yeah. give them credit when you find it. But yeah, it's so beautiful. And it's something that we tend to forget. We tend to try to not think about this, of our mortality. But yeah, we we can't live life like we're going to be immortal when we should try to think look i have i don't have i don't know how many years i have yeah. you don't know it can be tomorrow it can be 50 years from now it can be even 100 years from now with t new technologies that may arrive we don't know but anyways our time is limited and we don't want to get to the end of the time and think wow I should have taken those risks. I should have done this. I should have done that. Why not just do it and see what mm -hmm. happens? Of course not. Oh, YOLO. Let's not that kind of stuff. But there are many risks that you know that you're not going to die if you try. So why not? Exactly. That's that's why I've, I've I really taken up the um, the challenge of increasing my presence online because I was striving for greatness, but I was also like learning in the shadows and, you know, I didn't voice much. I didn't articulate much. And that's what's beautiful about having uh, platforms online like X is to be able to set discussions and really think out loud with other individuals too about issues and the ideas in which I come up with and uh, I really am trying to make it visible that we all of us have a part to play 
in the well-being of our environment. And I'm not talking about reduction of uh, CO2 emissions. I'm talking about like really how we use the planet, how we use up the space we have and and how uh, we interact with it and how we have to be aware that our behaviors are a product of the environment that's constructed for us and the way we plan for the future is going to determine the way how people are going to behave and going to act and how society is also going to develop later and it's um it's a cool profession planning because it involves so many disciplines all together. And what I love about being on Spaces on X is that it's very open to everybody. Everybody can have a say because everybody has a voice. Everybody has a... Um, have rights, have needs, have wants, and also they have their experiences to really um, articulate what is good for everybody. It's uh, not just the planet that's going to plan a city. It could be a psychologist, it could be a sociologist, it could be an economist, it could be even an accountant. Anybody can do it. Everybody can do it because we're all we're all living in this uh, earth, and it's really important that everybody's taken into account. And that's what's cool about being right now on X is people are realizing that it's it's where we live. It's where we're gonna be interacting where we're going to be working, where we're going to be having fun. And it's uh, knowing what to do in that place with the time we have. Yeah, I think it's beautiful when you say that anyone can be a city planner because in a way we already are. If you plan a tree or if you open up a new shop, a new business, you already are partaking in city planning as well. Yeah, you are. Exactly. It's just that I I hope that I can at least bring some thought into it. And that, of course, if somebody is willing to open up a business, then I can talk to them about it to and make them aware that location is key. Mar the market situation has to be considered. Maybe it's not the right city. Maybe it's not exactly the right moment for you to have that location maybe you can start off in your basement and utilize the space you already have and it's um i think that as i go along there's going to be more people that are going to be interested in knowing what i know just so they can have better decisions on what in their in their life actually because Location is everything, even if we have internet and we think uh, it's it doesn't matter, we can do our online business, but sorry, but if you're going to be selling products online and you're going to be selling like t-shirts, you're going to have to be aware that you're going to be, uh, there's going to be certain setbacks, there's going to be maybe production line problems, there's going to be problems with the supply chain, there's going to be issues with uh, trucking and getting to the customer, and those are all elements that if you understand how uh, real world infrastructures work, you understand that the risks and benefits of doing business. Yeah, there's a reason why people pay a premium for a AAA location. Yeah. Like they say, location, location, location. Exactly. And yeah, I, I think this is one of the most fun parts of working with real estate is talking to the entrepreneurs or the prospective clients, prospective tenants on, is this the right place for your, the kind of business you want to do? Is this the right city for you? I think those discussions can be a lot of fun, very strategic. Man, I, I see that 
how much time do you do you want to go on? How much time do you have? I think that we will catch each other on spaces. What time is it? Oh yeah, I got my girlfriend waiting. <laughs> so, oh, sorry about uh, that. Maybe can I ask you the last question that I always ask, and then we can finish from there. Of course you can. Okay, and and if there's anything you want to cut, you can just tell me later, and then we we'll cut it. Maybe maybe when I said psychological need instead of physiological need. That's oh yeah, you, you said it a bunch of times. <laughs> All right, let's shoot it up. Last question. Let's go. Alex, this conversation has been a lot of fun, and I'm sure that anyone that's listening or watching this can get a lot of value, and at least they can get a small degree on urban planning and architecture. There's a question that I always ask everyone that comes here, and that is, what's your definition of success? Interesting. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It was freaking great. We went off a lot of tangents because, well, I'm I'm that kind of individual. I have, I have a lot of issues with structure, and when I have thoughts coming in, it just goes, 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 goes. And uh, people are, I think people are gonna have a hard time following the combo, but they're gonna understand the essence that it's just two guys talking and just uh, having a great time and uh, being able to switch and dialogue around. But my definition of success, well, after this convo, I, I've actually written down my answer before. My answer when I was just in my booklet writing was uh, to employ people and not having to punch in and out. So say like, I like to be free. I like to have freedom and I like to help others. It was that in that essence. And that's kind of the ultimate goal is eventually I think I will have to be self-employed because I am not the kind of person that likes to always be told what to do, but I love to listen to what people need and act upon it. Because then I know that it's not an order, but it's more like me offering my help and I like to help a lot of people and yeah so it's really to have this fulfillment of being helpful and the best way I can and the skills that I can and to have really be happy of uh, my time here and like that that definition I said, like uh, to have meaningful people around my deathbed. That's beautiful, man. And to act upon it as well. Because uh, like you said, it's it's hard with like the day-to-day -to, -day to stay focused on that. It really is difficult. Like we... Sometimes we, we have this tunnel vision of... Uh, trying to attain something and doing sometimes whatever it takes to fulfill it. And we kind of forget the big picture. And it's, it's this, it's just to be mindful and really um, not to forget that it's, we have to take advantage of what we got and really appreciate it. It's beautiful, man. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. This was awesome. Ladies and gentlemen, this was Alexander Pachala. He's the best city planner in the whole Montreal area. If Thank anyone you. needs him, just call him up on X. He also holds awesome spaces on city planning and everything regarding yeah. architecture and that kind of situation. So thank you so much for coming, man. I uh, really appreciate it. Uh, my X handle is alexpg01 slash eth eth and my spaces are every Saturday uh, on 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time so yeah follow me catch me up there we'll have a great chat 
I go along with a lot of topics on cities and land use planning. So thank you, um, Gabriel, for having me. It was a great discussion. I didn't know we were going to go this far, but I'm pretty sure that uh, it will be an amazing episode for you and your repertoire. And I hope that you get a nice rock and roll to success with this project that you have. Hell yeah. Thank you, my man. Thank you very much. Yes. Yeah, uh, she, she... Is it still recording? Okay. No, uh, she, she, we had a long talk about this and um, I did have a lot of occasions in my life where I, I missed out on opportunities and not really like pushing myself and really going off 